All right, we are on to our new topic set, topic set four. And when we start looking at this topic set, we're now moving from our kinematic relationship, so all the stuff that Galileo taught us about motion and how we know that there's velocities and all that stuff, to now let's transition into what Newton is going to tell us, which is why does motion occur, okay? And this is actually a form of, of physics where we start to talk about things in terms of this word dynamics, okay? So so what is it that makes things go, okay? And now we're, we're going to get into this whole debate on forces, and so how do forces work? Um, because I do have this, uh, you know, we're talking laws of motion, and I know that they taught you laws of motion way back when. And again, these concepts aren't big. I actually pulled this book off the shelf. I, I bought this book. I figured it'd be a good one. This is called Newton and Me. Um, and if you haven't, if I haven't told you guys yet, I do have a four-year-old son at home, and he, uh, of course, enjoys having stories read to him. And so I thought, well, we should already start instilling some of this interest in science. So I picked up this book, and it's called Newton and Me. And as you can see, this uh, little boy has a bike. He's got a dog. And the cool thing is, is his shirt has a formula on it, and it's a mathematical formula. So we'll have to add that to the board, I think, the, the hanging boards of formulas. But anyways, I thought I'd read you a little bit of it. I don't think I'll take the time to read the whole thing. But um, anyways, it starts this way. Saturday morning, I was asleep in my bed when Newton, my dog, dropped his ball on my head. Dropping an object, you know what that means, gravity. Oh, wait. Okay. I pull on my blue jeans, t-shirt, and shoes, and ate a quick breakfast while Dad read the news. Then Newton and I ran out the back door. We had the whole day to play and explore. Okay. All right, so now we're getting into the whole exploring stuff. I rolled Newton's ball to him along the ground. As we played with the ball, here's what we found. The ball won't roll far in the rough, grassy yard. It rolls much farther on a surface that's smooth and hard. But it won't roll at all if I don't give it a push. When I push it too hard, it rolls as far as the bush. So we're talking about bushes, okay. I decide to throw the ball up in the sky. I threw the ball hard. It went really high. No matter how hard I would throw the ball up, it would always come down to me and my pup. This gave me an idea I wanted to test. I took out the red truck that I like the best. I put down the truck on the ground that was flat. Until I push, my truck stayed where it sat. That's an interesting concept, and one that we'll talk about soon. Going downhill, my truck really speeds. It went off the sidewalk and up into the weeds. When I pushed my toy truck, it went really far. But even my big push won't move my dad's car. I heard my mom calling for Newton and me. She wanted some rocks from a pile by the tree. We pulled my red wagon to the tree at a run. Newton and I knew this job would be fun. I filled up my wagon with piles of stones. But with all of the rocks, I couldn't pull it alone. It was When it was empty, it was easy to pull. I just couldn't move it when it was full. Newton and I got some help from my dad. He pushed while I pulled. We made my mom glad. Okay, So you can see that we're starting to get into some, some big concepts here. We're talking about you know being able to push or pull an object and how, how much mass does the object have. And that's kind of the key thing that we're starting to look at when we move into this new topic set is, is so far everything that we looked at when we we're studying motion, it didn't matter how much mass we had. So like our our match, uh, our Hot Wheels cars, we didn't know the masses. And every car might have a different mass, which might indicate that we'd have some changes. So let's go ahead and let's talk a little bit about the Newton's laws of motion. Now again, when we look at laws of motion, we always start to think of this guy who gave them to us, or who I would say first published them, and this is Isaac Newton. So what we really want to know is, who is this guy that we call Newton? Now I found a nice picture of him, and apparently all physicists have really bad hair. That's what I've, I've come to notice, is that most of them have bad hair. Um, and Newton's no exception, although I think it's probably a wig that he's wearing. 
Um, now, Newton essentially took the stuff that, that Galileo did. Okay, and Galileo was, was the one who studied objects rolling down ramps, and we looked at this, and he determined that there was this acceleration due to gravity. Um, and what Newton was able to do was he was able to take the things that Galileo said and advance it further in science. See, there was a kind of counterpoint that was going on in this, and it was our, our lovely Greek philosopher Aristotle, who if uh, you, know, you know anything about Aristotle in the chemistry world, he was like the guy who set back chemistry for like 2,000 years because of his whole concept of what he thought the atom should be. He didn't believe in atoms. And where we were going with it. Well, he kind of did the same thing here. And he said that if an object is going to be moving, it, there has to be some kind of a force attached to it. And so you can't, you can't have constant motion without a constant push or a constant force. And this is where Newton kind of changed that whole belief system. He says, you know, there's going to be a change here because it, it isn't always the case. We don't always have to have a constant force applied in order to get an object to move because that's going to be one of our laws of motion. Now, he wrote these laws of motion to be kind of universal. He wanted them to apply in a lot of different situations, so it was very basic. Um, he did publish them, and so that was kind of where we're at with uh, these laws of motion. And they're the same laws of motion that we learned in ninth grade. And some of you probably started learning the concepts at a very young age in some of our early science classes. So again, when we start talking about these things in physics, most of it is stuff that we've, we've hit the core concepts before. And so that's why some of it seems not too bad. It's usually the algebra that we get in this class in particular that starts to bog down some uh, of the um, understanding. It's usually the math related stuff. So, All right. Now, at, speaking of math, this is one of the things that Newton did is he decided that he needed an entire new language in order to speak what he wanted to speak. And he developed this whole concept of calculus. So calculus became a new branch in math and it was really due to the fact that Newton needed to be able to talk about what he saw was happening with the works of Galileo. Um, ideally, we look at this, and, and those of you that have had some calculus, you might recognize the fact that when we take our kinematic relationship, D equals uh, VIT plus one half AT squared, that relationship, if you do a derivative of that relationship, you actually end up getting VF equals VI plus a t and if we do a derivative of that relationship we get a is equal to a that's how we get our acceleration and so that's going to be the re the way that we linked all of this and so we talked about it in terms of constant acceleration okay those of you that didn't or haven't taken any calculus don't worry again we're we're not trying to scare you with that um, now again a lot of this all comes about the fact that oops no I gotta erase this here so we can read what I was written there. A lot of the stuff that Galileo or that Newton came up with was was theorized, or I should say, the the legend or the myth is, is that he was sitting there and got hit by an apple, or he perceived to see an apple fall, and it made him start thinking about why does it fall? There has to be something that's that's pulling on it. It's either got to be a push or it's got to be a pull, and so then he started to look at this and said, well. There's got to be this whole gravity thing, this acceleration that Galileo was talking about. And so he started to say, well, all objects have mass, and so all objects are going to have some kind of a pull or an attraction between each other. And this is where he developed the universal law of gravitation. So it worked not only between like the apple and the earth, but it works between, say, the earth and the moon and the earth and the sun and the sun and the other planets. And so we started to take things that Kepler was talking about. And Kepler is a, an astronomer or a scientist of that same kind of era where he was looking at the movement of celestial bodies and comparing it with what um, Newton was talking about in terms of, of objects and the forces applied on him. Um, we'll get into more detail with the universal law of gravitation in this unit as well. So just kind of previewing a few of the things that we're going to talk about. Now, our first law of motion is um, sometimes called the law of inertia. And so this is a, a picture I found I thought was a good demonstration. So you can see somebody is getting punched. And you see the tip of his nose looks very bent. And it's because his face is kind of shifting 
but the tip of his nose wanted to stay in one spot, okay? And so typically that's what we refer to as inertia. Inertia is a property in which you want to resist the change in motion, okay? Inertia is a property where you want to resist the change in motion. And all matter has that property of inertia. Um, now in ninth grade science, we probably defined what the first law of motion was, and so it's probably when something like an object at rest stays at rest, an object in motion stays in motion, okay? So in other words, if an object is sitting there, it has its inertia and it wants to stay there because of that inertia. But if an object is in motion, it has inertia as well and it wants to stay in that motion as long as there's no external forces acting on it. Okay, and So that's kind of the thing that we didn't talk about a lot or tie into this, is that a force has to be applied in order to make something change this situation. So that's our first law of motion. And again, Inertia is nothing more than a property of matter, and you might even remember this from our Bill Nye the Science Guy songs, and if you haven't seen any Bill Nye the Science Guy at all, you should probably go check it out. Most of them you can YouTube now, and, and then you can listen to the theme song. Um, and again, it's a property that resists that change of motion. We do look at this and we say that when this is in, in a situation, when we see that there's, you're either at rest or you're in motion, and I should say this motion needs to be constant velocity. So if you're under a constant velocity situation where your motion is constant, okay, that's what they mean by stay in motion, we're looking at a situation where all of the forces that are acting upon that object are in balance, okay? And we may use the word equilibrium, okay? It just means that they're balancing each other out, they're canceling each other out. There's no net force, okay? Which really ties into this, what I see on his shirt. It's, he's got a little F net on there, and so we'll probably talk about why, what, what it means to be a net force. Um, so that was kind of our first law of motion. I'll probably do a little demonstration first law of motion tomorrow as well. Um, we're going to get into the second law of motion. And the second law of motion is our equation here, which is our FAMA, our F equals MA. And again, when we refer to this, we're going to refer to this in terms of this net force. Okay, net force. And that's kind of where we see that he has it on his shirt, F net. So let's talk a little bit about what what did you learn in ninth grade science when it came to the second law of motion, okay? Second law of motion was that if you wanted to accelerate an object, you needed to apply a force. So again, first law of motion, object at rest stays at rest, object in motion stays in motion, constant motion, or constant velocity. If you apply a force, you create this thing, acceleration. So a force applied will give us an acceleration on that object. That's kind of the key thing here. If I look at it, the more force that you apply, the greater the acceleration. The less force that you apply, the less acceleration. So my arrow here, the red arrow, represents my amount of force. If I have a bigger arrow or a broader arrow, I'm applying more force, I'm going to see a great acceleration because the green dot represents the mass and the mass isn't changing. If you don't push on it as with as much force, well, you're not going to get it to move as much, okay? And so that's kind of what we're saying there, we're looking at it in terms of those. Um, if we apply this, then let's say we have an equal amount of force. So I'm going to swing a golf club, and I swing a golf club the same amount of force every time. So in other words, the F that I apply here is the same as the F is the same as the F. Well, if I change this, okay, if I have a small mass, I get a big acceleration, okay? But if I have a big mass, I get a small acceleration. So the difference is golf balls are made really small. They're made with very little mass, so I can have great acceleration. Where a truck, if I tried to push a truck with my golf club, well, the truck has a big mass, and so I'm not going to get as much acceleration. Okay, so that's where I would get an inverse relationship between that, where the other one was more of a direct relationship. So if force is held constant, as mass increases, the acceleration goes down. Um, but if we say the mass is the same, as I increase my force, I get an increase in acceleration. So again, it's mathematical relationship. Okay. So now we're looking at it in terms of 
of because it's a math relationship, we have a value to it. What happens when we multiply these two things together? So if I take a mass and I take it times an acceleration, I get kilograms times meters per second squared. I get a kilogram meters per second squared. And say that.